Hi, I'm Brian Johnson. I'm a Director of Applied Innovation and Process Improvement at Otsuka Pharmaceutical. And I'm going to speak to you today, today about using technology to develop digital biomarkers and improve the efficiency of clinical trials. Just a quick disclaimer, the opinions that I'll be presenting are those of myself, not necessarily the opinions of Otsuka or any affiliates of Otsuka or any collaborating companies. So I wanna set the stage first. The healthcare industry is becoming more consumer focused and consumer technology companies are stepping in to help drive. The question from a pharmaceutical company perspective is, how can we adapt and how can clinical trials adapt? Because we're either going to be collaborating with healthcare and technology companies or competing with them. And many pharmaceutical companies have started collaborations and those have gone well. But it's not something that's rolled out more widely yet um, or that has been accepted across the industry. So if we take a look just at some of the recent headlines that kind of showcase some of this intersection between healthcare and technology, it's clear that digital technology is now driving healthcare. Just a few examples where you see this intersection that also includes pharmaceuticals. IBM has worked with companies to introduce blockchain into clinical trials. Microsoft is building bots to help match patients to clinical trials. And we've seen companies such as Apple and other wearable companies that have been using those technology, those digital tools to really help uh, gather healthcare data. One great example is Best Buy. So this is a large consumer electronic retail store, but what they've done is become the first US retailer to sell an FDA approved kit for collecting vital and physiological signs at home that can then be transmitted to a physician for review. They've also quietly rolled out something called Assured Living which is a program that has 24 seven monitoring of seniors and the elderly living at home. And it allows caregivers and family members to use digital sensors to monitor the care of their elderly family members. It allows them to be notified if someone has not gotten out of bed when uh, they usually do, if they haven't opened a medicine cabinet to take their medication at the proper time. So this is a great example of kind of the merging of healthcare and technology to improve patients' lives. So while these are, you know, just some interesting headlines, I think the, the question is, you know, what does this mean in tangible terms for clinical trials? And so I wanna talk about two specific ways in which these this digital technology is helping with the clinical trial space. And, the examples that I wanna talk about are virtual clinical trials and digital biomarkers. So virtual cl clinical trials are clinical trials in which most of the data collection is done via remote sensors or digital tools, or almost always using telemedicine, something that's been in the news pretty frequently recently because of the COVID-19 pandemic and that reluctance to have face-to-face -face interactions with patients. So this is something that has been looked at within clinical trials for years, but is now really coming to the forefront. Digital biomarkers are another great area where that healthcare technology interaction can be utilized in clinical trials. So digital biomarkers are essentially digital tools or digital sensors that are used to capture physiological data or patient behavior. And they could subsequently be used in uh, the uh, algorithms to inform on patient care, patient behavior, and clinical trials. One great example of this and how it compares to a traditional assessment is in the area of cognitive impairment. So as you can see there on the right-hand side, uh, there's something called a hand-drawn clock, hand clock test. This is something that neuropsychologists sometimes use to assess cognitive impairment in individuals. When someone that has some level of cognitive impairment is asked to draw a clock and a certain time on a clock, they often have challenges with that. They can't draw it to scale. They can't draw it with the correct time. The problem with this is traditionally this is assessed by a physician in a subjective manner. 
they look at that and based on what the patient has done, they've got to make an assessment on whether or not they have impairment. What they can't do such a great job is, you know, how severe is that? What is the gradient of that? So an example of a digital biomarker that can potentially replace this is using eye tracking. And so with this technology, a camera is used on a computer screen and a patient is asked to, to track the movement of an object on the screen. And individuals with cognitive impairment may have delays or may have trouble tracking that uh, object on the screen. And so using that camera, you can detect that in a very objective, very precise manner, and it gives you a sense of that cognitive impairment, both from a severity level as well as from a gradient level. So one area in which digital biomarkers have a tremendous potential is in mental health and psychiatry. And this is an area where patients continue to seek new and novel ways to understand their health. So as you can see on the left there, this is a research study from a, a few years ago where a company called Acuvia had looked at what was out there in terms of health-related apps on the various app stores. And what they found is that almost 30% of those health-related apps were in the area of mental health and behavioral disorders. And so what this shows is those patients are really looking for new ways to understand their health. Digital biomarkers also have the potential to fill a gap in clinical trials. Because in clinical trials, and particularly in mental health and psychiatry, the endpoints or the outcomes that we use are almost always rating scales or clinical interviews. So they're based on a face-to-face -face interaction with a physician and a patient. And it's a subjective assessment that potentially introduces bias. So if we had some sort of objective measure, a digital measure that could collect some type of data and give us uh, a sense of symptom severity, disease severity, treatment effect, without that subjective or that potential for bias, that would potentially improve that quality. And you can see there on the image on the right, just some, some examples of various types of uh, digital biomarkers that are collected through digital tools. So sleep and activity with smartwatches, sensors embedded in clothing, headbands for EEG, verbally assessing speech and cognition and mood. One of the challenges of this though, is that the collection of this amount of large sets of multimodal data, it requires a platform that can really ingest all that in real time and support analysis and review, review of that data. And so a cloud-based solution is one of the uh, potential options for doing this. Now I wanna talk about five areas or five types of digital biomarkers that uh, that I have an interest in and that we've been looking at at OTSCA. The first on the upper left is sleep and activity. So many disorders, and it, particularly in psychiatry, many disorders are marked by disrupted sleep. So for example, depressed patients have markedly diminished activity and psychomotor agitation or retardation. So they're, they're more lethargic, they have less movement, they have more sleep or disrupted sleep. And this is something that is in a clinical trial usually assessed by asking the patient to keep a sleep diary or by having a face-to-face -face interview and asking them, that patient, about their sleep, about their activity levels. And so again, it's not necessarily a very objective assessment, but we could potentially get this data from wearables or from other types of sensors and really get a more accurate picture of sleep and activity. Another digital biomarker is mood assessment, as you can see there on the bottom left. So mood assessment refers to, in the digital biomarker sense, refers to biased attention to different emotions. So for example, individuals with depression or anxiety, if shown as theories of expressions, facial expressions of pictures of individuals, they will tend to focus more on uh, those expressions they perceive as more sad in depression or more anxious for anxiety disorders. And so this can potentially be something that's more objective 
then again, asking questions and recording kind of on rating scales or clinical interview. And this is often done with an active task. It can be done on a, uh, on a tablet or on a phone, showing various pictures and asking an individual to select which one looks more sad or more anxious or more happy. But where I'd like to see it go and where there's some potential is even in a more passive sense. So using eye tracking and kind of passively assessing where on a computer screen an individual tends to focus when shown a series of facial expressions. In the upper right, another digital biomarker are, is passive sensing. And so what this refers to is utilizing the various sensors on smartphones or uh, wearable devices to get a sense of the geolocation and other aspects of phone use. This is always done in an anonymized way, but what you can get a sense of how much social activity one has. And so compared to a baseline state or normal activity, someone that is in a depressed state might have significantly less social activity as assessed by a smartphone. They may be leaving the home less. They may going, traveling, farther from home less than they normally would. And they may have other uh, usage that is a proxy for social isolation. So using texting less than you normally do, less phone calls. Conversely, someone that's in a, a manic state and bipolar disorder may have a lot more activity reflected in some of these sensors. So leaving the house much more often, having much more traveling as a sense by uh, anonymized geolocation. Maybe they're using texting quite frequently, phone calls frequently at, at different hours. So these, these, this is a really interesting digital biomarker that can really represent some of that activity more accurately than our traditional rating scales, self-report assessments. Speech analysis is another digital biomarker. So speech and vocal analysis have been demonstrated to, to effectively differentiate between various types of disorders. And what this involves is recording a, a patient's speech and then using digital analysis to detect the physiological aspects of that speech. So the strength of the voice, the tone, pause rate, loudness, pitch, and using a, a computer, computerized analysis of this, you can very effectively differentiate between people with and without depression, with and without Parkinson's, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, and many other disorders. Finally, cognition is another digital biomarker that I've had an interest in. So many diseases show a deficit or an impairment on uh, cognition, or what we sometimes refer to as executive function. So the ability to focus, the ability to pay attention. This is something that similar to the clock drawn test I mentioned earlier, has, was always done with paper and pencil methods. In recent years, it's generally done with computerized batteries, but they also still tend to be quite long. And so what we've seen develop in the digital biomarker space is using much briefer, more frequent assessments that can be delivered on a tablet, on a smartphone, or even a smartwatch. So I've talked about a number of different digital biomarkers, but the question is, how do we really enable them and how do we make clinical trials more efficient using them? And so to do that, I want to take a step back and show where from a clinical trial perspective, how is technology advanced and how does it lend itself to digital biomarkers and uh, greater efficiency? So if we go back to you know, 2013 at OTSCA, we were still conducting most of our trials in a paper-based format. So as we track the medications, Applying clinical trials was done via paper. Informed consent was done via paper. And subject charts or the subject data that is reported in a clinical trial, all done on paper and then transcribed into the EDC system or the electronic data capture system. And even at that time, some pharmaceutical companies were still doing paper-based uh, and didn't have direct entry in, into an EDC system. The problem with this is that it wouldn't allow uh, one to see the full breadth of that data. You only had limited snapshots of that data, so you could never really get the full picture. So as we jump ahead to 2014, 2015, and OTSCA, we were fortunate because we were one of the early adopters of technology in clinical trials. We understood the importance of, of how it could help 
make trials more efficient. So we started to shift from paper-based to have more of a digital ecosystem. So we started using electronic consent, electronic source instead of paper-based patient data. And we also had this data coming in more of a real-time manner into uh, a centralized uh, database that also allowed us to pull data from other sources, lab data, uh, biomarker data from wearables, for example. Much more efficient than how this was traditionally done, where on a monthly basis, you would get transfers from those different device companies or vendors. The following year, 2016, we started to really roll out what we called our e-platform. So we shifted to be fully digital, fully electronic in our clinical trials. We had a central database that at the time called the Beehive, but everything came into that central source. All of our patient data, our e-consent data, app data, wearable type data. And we were able to surface that data into uh, e-surveillance or study dashboards that would allow investigators, um, our CERO partners, uh, those that had needed access to that for the conduct of the trial, be able to review it. And so as we fast forward to the present day, 2019, 2020, and although we had made great strides in shifting from that paper base to the electronic format, um, there are still some things that we can always improve on. So we've consolidated some of this. We now have all that vendor data coming into what we call the Atsuka Big Data Platform, but we're still just scratching the surface of the huge amount of multimodal data we can get from digital tools, sensors, digital biomarkers, and incorporating into that. And so where we really want to shift, and we've set a time frame about 30 months to be there, is using a more consolidated system. One system that has many of these vendors that you see on the left already incorporated in part of that same system. So e-consent, e-source, IRT, wearable type devices with already integrated in one system, um, and then feeding that into our Atsuka Big Data platform. Now, in order to really enable this with all of this data, we need a cloud-based system, something like AWS provides. And so that's part of this, this timeline as well, is to shift these things from internal databases servers to a cloud-based platform that really allows anyone that's authorized and needs access to that clinical trial data for their view and conduct of the trial to access in real time to be able to perform those analyses and perform those reviews without any delay. So in summary, from a, from a clinical trial perspective, we need to recognize the significant digital changes that are taking place at the intersection of technology and healthcare. And pharmaceutical companies and those who conduct clinical trials really need to leverage that technology specifically that cloud-based technology that AWS provides to continue to develop new and efficient ways to conduct clinical trials. Thank you.